Um, so to begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, it is upon their land that the University of Sydney and the Chowchak Museum is built. And I would like to um, honour their elders past and present. Um, thank you for coming to today's talk and braving today's weather, if you're in here in person. Um, and thank you also for joining us on Zoom. We're very excited to have you join us. Um, if you are an old hand at these talks, welcome back. And if you're new, um, thank you for coming. If you'd like to follow more of our talks or come to more of our talks, you can follow us on social media, both on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, but the best way to do it is join up to our mailing list. And we'll be posting that link in the chat. Um, otherwise, you can come talk to myself or Lorraine or Akata who are here in the room, and we can tell you how to join up um, to that as well. Um, once again, we're grateful to be in the Chow Chak Wing Museum. It was Matt who was the first person to actually suggest that we should hold it in here, and we're very glad that he made that suggestion. We think it's worked out fantastically. Um, and as always, the museum is open to nine o'clock um, this evening, so, you know, feel free to hang around. Um, this is a particularly good one to hang around after because Matt will be talking about one of the exhibitions. Um, it's also a good one to hang around because I noticed that the cafe is doing a free wine tasting today. Um, they said you had to sign up by the 16th, but I reckon we can get our way in. Um, and they're also open to 9 p.m. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end of the talk. So if you do have any questions, please hang around. Um, and if you have any questions and you're on Zoom, just type them into the chat and, chat and one of our, uh, us will read it out for you. Um, so without any more um, house rules and the like, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Matt Pohl, who is the curator um, of Indigenous heritage and in charge of the repatriation project here at the Chow Chak Wing Museum. Um, previous um, exhibitions that Matt has curated um, at this museum or the Maclay and at previous museums before that, um, uh, in stone, the last copy of which the catalog for is on sale in the gift shop at yours for 1995, 20% off if you're a friend of the Nicholson collection. So I strongly encourage you if you enjoy um, it, Matt's talk to go out and get it because it is a, is a rare book now, it's the last one. Um, he's also the co-curator of the Jalkri exhibition upstairs on level four. And he's also got a chapter in the um, um, corresponding publication, um, which is also for sale at the gift shop for 49.95. <laughs> Um, other exhibitions that he's um, worked on are Eora College Class of 2013 at the Verge Gallery and at the Tin Sheds for Transit of Venus. Um, as I said, he's co-curator with the exhibition on Level 4, Jalkery. Um, welcome to, sorry, I'm going to, it's the wrong way around. Um, uh, welcome to your new foundations. Um, but today he's going to talk to about the exhibition he um, curated, which is across all four levels of the Chow Chak Wing Museum Ambassadors. And um, I won't say anything more about that because that's the topic of Matt's talk. So I'll hand it over to Matt. Thank you. That's a really great intro, Simon. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I previously worked at the McLean Museum for 11 years or so. So to be able to um, design one of the inaugural exhibitions of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander collections for the new Chow Chak Wing Museum was a pretty incredible experience. Um, today, I think I'd just give you a bit of an overview of each of the eight ambassador display cases, but also break down some of the thinking and the philosophy behind the exhibition and how we sort of came together to distribute it across different areas of the museum. Um, when you come into the museum in the foyer, and the, this exhibition case here is actually a bit of an index to all of the other eight ambassador display cases which are distributed throughout the museum. Um, it was a real early choice in some ways about do we just have one room um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia? Or do we try and arrange these assemblages of what turned out to be like 100 objects across 25 different language groups and give them a real sense of agency in themselves as standalone exhibition cases? You'll notice they're actually in conversation and dialogue, sometimes intervening into the other exhibition, the other 17 exhibitions which are distributed throughout the museum. And it was a real conscious choice in that way to not have not have something that you could sort of walk by. Um, these display cases are um, distributed in a way that you actually um, get different correspondences and dialogues with all of the other objects from the other civilizations and other cultures around the world which are on display. So acknowledging country um, 
is one of the key ceremonial protocols which has become real to the forefront in terms of museums, uh, the whole galleries, libraries, archives, museum section. How do we, it's, it's spoken at events like today, but also how do you make like a tangible acknowledgement of country into the threshold of the museum space? There's all sorts of ways that we worked with um, and collaborated with the many communities and community representatives who over a number of years now have all worked um, with our collections. And it was quite an impossible task to do justice to so many of the incredible feedback that people had given us. We had an advisory group for the Chow Chuck Wing Museum project group, um, consisting of around 12 members from different faculties across the campus. And there was also a larger um, project group of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members that implemented what's called the Wingaira Mura Barabagu uh, design principle strategy. There's around seven new buildings on campus, which are in various stages of being formed over the last few years. You might've seen the new Susan Wakel Health Building, for example. Um, there's a great program of public artworks. Uh, the new Judy Watson work was just launched last week. Um, as well as uh, about four or five others that you'll see, which are all part of um, embedding consultation with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stakeholders into the very early stages of the design process, as well as um, at various stages throughout. And one of the key ways that we were able to do that was, um, you know, when we spoke across all these different groups about the opportunity we had to merge the older 19th century Maclay Museum, for example, which is much more focused on natural history and cultural anthropology and you know, merge it with the university art collection and the Nicholson Museum. It became a really important opportunity to build a 21st century museum that incorporated this community feedback about how they would actually use the museum. What do they find useful? What don't they like? Um, there's all sorts of ways that little elements of their conversation inform design choices that you'll see. Even some of the color tone, for example, is drawn from the fact that this university, the land that we're on sits on a sandstone ridge, which helped inform the sandstone sort of colors you see in the concrete facades and throughout the building. Another really innovative way we were able to give our collections a new sense, even our non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander collections, was to do smoking ceremonies at various stages of the project. So we had a smoking ceremony at the first turning of soil here in the museum. Um, we did smoking ceremonies in the older storerooms before all the objects were moved on site. And we did smoking ceremonies inside the empty building after it was first built. Even when you go through the Nicholson galleries with the human remains, which are on display as part of the Egypt galleries, at the request of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, we were able to give them a sort of a, a ceremonial greeting into the museum space, which I think was incredibly innovative. Not many museums actually have the chance to do that and to actually start the building fresh with um, a cleansing ceremony. Um, there's been other really great projects like this happening all across Sydney in a sense. Um, but this is from our, I think it's the third stage of the smoking ceremony when we actually officially launched the building. So yeah, you can get a sense here of inside the storerooms. I mean, for museums to really embrace this is incredibly innovative. Um, you know, basically you're starting a fire, which, you know, <laughs> inside a storeroom, it's complete anathema to what a collection would actually be managed. Um, you can imagine trying to do this in a library, for example, or different things like that. So for our, um, you know, project user groups and the builders and architects, I think we were able to sort of teach them a little bit about how um, the ceremonial protocols are just so important. Um, I mean, it is a, it's a way to start a ceremony. Um, sometimes uh, smoking ceremonies happen at funerals, sometimes they happen at births. Um, there's actually peer reviewed research that particular types of eucalypt leaves have um, anti antibacterial sort of properties, you know, in a very mild sense. But um, in terms of embracing um, a tradition of welcome, of acknowledgement, and you know, being very visible about our commitment to that um, recognition of Aboriginal ceremonial protocols as they existed on the lands of the Gadigal. It was an, um, an amazing um, opportunity to witness how that worked. Um, 
one of the other key design from our consultations came through what is essentially one of the most unrecognized and amazing aspects of Sydney's story, Aboriginal past. Um, when you go through the Garingai National Park, for example, in the northern beaches of Sydney, there's just thousands of rock engravings, petroglyphs. Um, some of these sites can have hundreds of little motifs and designs. Um, you know, there's a saying that when you're approaching one of these um, uh, engraving sites, you're approaching sacred ground. You know, they weren't done for nothing. They're not idle, abstract sort of drawings either. They may, some of these might have been quite important uh, ceremonial grounds. And one of the responsibilities of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council is with National Parks and Wildlife Service to manage these sites. They're incredibly under-resourced though. Um, there's like two offices at the moment, I think from their height of when there was around eight Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, rangers working across the national parks. I mean, in some ways, the best way to preserve these is to let them be overgrown and protected from some of the, um, well, there has been, you know, instances of vandalism that have happened in these sites. But I think it's also a really important way to um, signal the university's future engagement. There have been several uh, great um, academics at the university over the years, like John Clegg, who have done great survey work of the rock engravings of Sydney. And it's one of those things that their story is yet to be told. The better we get at um, using the university's resources to assist places like Metropolitan Land Council and design um, co-management projects where our resources are better implemented into surveying, mapping. Um, there is quite a lot of information in archives, for example. At one stage, they used to be able to get a scouts badge for um, documenting sites in Sydney. Um, so to get that sense of Sydney's amazing story, I mean, it is the largest rock engraving outcrop on the whole east coast of Australia. And we just don't do it justice in that sense. So in some ways, the, the rock engraving out in the forecourt is also a bit of a wayfinding point. It's where our campus heritage tours led by Uncle Jimmy Smith here, who for the last few years has been doing walking tours across the campus can sort of gather people together. Um, it's where people gather before they come into the museum. It's also quite a, a significant rock engraving, which uh, Jimmy Smith was working as the education officer at Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council at the time. And this was, um, a rock engraving that we had a fiberglass mold of, which a previous director of the Maclay Museum had initiated. And um, it's a beautiful signal to that sort of the history of if you ever visited the old Maclay Museum before, you used to greet you as you walked into the stairs in the museum. So to do a direct um, translation of a, trans of a fiberglass mold of a rock engraving, which was destroyed during some roadworks, it wasn't actually destroyed, it was moved to another park. And we've sort of tracked down different areas where it might be up in Hornsby Heights. But um, the story of how we actually um, document that better is one of the many projects that sort of is in my to-do box, <laughs> working with volunteers and lots of other sort of projects like that. But at least it was the starting point. So for Metro, it was a really important way to signal their um, future engagement with the university and hopefully something that we can really build upon and do something quite incredible with. Also, the, the outdoor ceremonial space was another really key innovative design. Um, sometimes um, when you're practicing ceremony, to be able to take your shoes off and feel the glass, the grass, sorry, to um, and get distracted by the glass. Um, you know, you need water to do a smoking ceremony properly. You know, sometimes they get a bit out of hand as well. You know, people you know, um, using too many leaves. It's also a great space of First Nations dialogue. So in those early stages of implementing the Wingara Mura strategy to have an, off, an outdoor space, which we could use to um, hold all sorts of formal and informal ceremonies. I mean, we could also use this for small dance performances. It's envisaged that it could be used when um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students are graduating, for example. There's a, it's a completely multi-purpose space that, um, also sits outside our auditorium. So you can see the window there with the indoor out there for different sort of events. But to be able to build um, a functioning, you know, green room almost, it's where we sort of do offsite things was pretty, um, another one of those really interesting designs where we built community consultation into the actual architecture of the building. 
and made it much more culturally functionable. Um, even through the Sydney College of the Arts, which moved onto campus last year, they have an amazing glass blowing studio downstairs. So um, thanks to Brent, who undertook all the um, smoking ceremonies over a couple of weeks, he divide, devised these new sort of protocols of how we, um, engage, how we hold smoking ceremonies in the future. Um, it's why we chose the smoky aspect to the glass. And so ashes from each fire are put back into the, the glass container here and little bits of that are sprinkled back into future fires. So in some ways, we actually wrote a whole new protocol for smoking ceremonies as part of we would for any facilities management. And um, it's just a way to keep that ceremonial aspect and preserve the knowledge of it in that sort of sense as well as we as over the years, more smoking ceremonies will be added to it and more ashes will be added to it. And it'll tell a different sort of story of hopefully how much more our engagement has increased. One of the other design things that you can see a little bit of here is um, thanks to the amazing worker, Professor Jacqueline Troy, who wrote the book, The Sydney Language and her PhD research was on uh, bringing together all of the historical records um, from Sydney in the first, I think, five to 15 years of the colony and basically created a dictionary um, of the Sydney language as it was. Words from Gadigal, words from Darug, words from Gandangara or Garingai peoples, um, which has become a design book, uh, but many local councils all across Sydney are using. In our case, we selected this short list of um, uh, what we call Eora words to, to make it easier, um, names that are plants that we could name in the local Eora language as they were spoken for you know, several tens of thousands of years. Um, and that helped us choose things like the Gaddy, um, which is this anthurea tree. So Gadigal actually means the Gaddy plant, um, as well as some of the grasses and some of the other sort of more shrub-like sort of plants. But we can also, through that, take our education program outside and um, you know, get outside the classroom in a sense by um, through indigenous landscape design almost reincorporating a very short list. It, you know, it helped us make those final decisions. There's hundreds of different types of plants that you could put there, but through working with a very short list of um, language words, we um, were able to really push that up to the edge of the building as well. Um, from the larger project user group, there was an amazing um, design element which sort of comes through the lighting in the ceiling. So um, it was Norma Ingram and a bunch of other sort of uh, red fern elders and stuff that pointed out to us that um, the Damon, the Port Jackson fig tree, which rings all of the campus and rings a lot of the parks in Sydney, actually, it was a really great initiative of the Royal Botanic Gardens director in the early 20th century to um, just when you see parks of that era, they are all ringed with Port Jackson figs and Moreton Bay figs um, because the fig trees are sort of gathering spaces in that way. There are people used to sit under them, you know, making string or, you know, having conversations. So the way that the dappled light comes through the Port Jackson fig is also as a design motif, which was built into the light well, as you see in the, in the museum space. Um, and also another really interesting um, design element that came through those broader consultations you can see is the way that the museum sits on the slope of the land and you can almost see through it all the way down to Victoria Park. So the building wasn't imposing itself on the landscape. Um, you know, the outside of the building is no higher than the tree line, but because of the history of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people not feeling welcome in museums, to be able to sort of take that little element of feedback about wanting to um, come in and see it filled with light, open, you know, echoing the shape of the land, um, even the way the sandstone colors were picked to um, reflect the, that we sit on a sandstone ridge here um, on, the, on the, the kangaroo ground, as it was known in the early um, colonial records. Uh, really simple ways where community members um, can be involved in the decision-making process. It's not like they're making every decision, but things that are important to community um, are taken into account when you're making those design choices, whether it's colors, whether it's shape, whether it's things like light. You know, one of the great things I've noticed working in the museum is the way that um, throughout the day, 
the light changes so much. So it'll be really dark at some point. Sometimes it's really late in the afternoon. Um, sometimes it's really bright. Sometimes it seems different. It's not a static sort of space like that, which I think is another way to sort of, um, that the space is more open and inviting and welcoming. Um, you know, an acknowledgement of country is a welcome as well. So when you actually come through that whole threshold from the outside to the inside, you've got all these little elements where um, broader conversations with um, other key, with key community members who we really valued their feedback were taken into account in the design process of the building before you even see the exhibitions even. So it was a really, there's many elements like that that you can see throughout the space as well. But yeah, so why, um, you know, the university for more than 150 years has, um, you know, transformed the wealth of the Australian nation of Aboriginal land into the modern Australian nation. Um, museums played a huge role in that, not just the museums that we had here. Um, throughout the 30s, 40s and 50s, um, the university trained people in the anthropology department who implemented things like the stolen generation policies. You know, the university has um, put trained lawyers who've gone on to fight against native title determination cases. The university is not neutral in the sense of not having played a role in the construction of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander past. In some ways, you can look to the anthropology department of being, um, which was established in 1920 for like 50 years, they authored a version of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander past, which was not authored by the people themselves. And since the self-determination movement of the 1970s, it's been one of the huge shifts for that first person voice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to, to write their own history in their own language sometimes, you know, not even translating it back into English. Um, when you see the history of the state museums, for example, um, they had the same exhibition, like the Queensland Museum, Australian Museum, uh, Melbourne Museum, for 40, 50, 60 years in some cases, like they, were, they weren't changing, you know, and they were treating Aboriginal culture as a relic of the past. They have generations of non-Indigenous people who would see the same exhibition and think, no, well, that's the Aboriginal past. Whereas the living Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in these same communities had a very different version of that. You know, at one point there, um, with one of the other bark painting projects that we did, we sort of realized, you know, there's 40 exhibitions of um, bark paintings that toured to embassies all around the world from, especially after the World War II period. Yeah, this was a time when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people couldn't travel within Australia freely. So you have this version of their culture, um, you know, touring the world, um, attracting all this international attention. And yet the people themselves are in the living under the Missions and Reserves Act, um, you know, not allowed to travel to visit family members, not allowed to travel to undergo to undertake cultural responsibilities. Um, where the university sits in that um, obscuring of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander past is hard to locate. I mean, there are a lot of great histories. Um, just outside the museum here is where the Freedom Riders bus took off in 1960s. I think, um, you know, students from the university medical school helped establish the Redfern Medical Service. Students from the law faculty helped establish the Redfern Legal Service, um, the settlement project, the after school projects. Um, you can look to so many amazing things that actually, when you look at it, come from the students as much as from the broader university community itself and their activism in helping Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But, um, that's the barrier that we really had to break down and was one of the sort of guiding philosophies between the ambassadors exhibition and wanting to give the interpretive layer over these objects to community members was one of the key choices that um, informed overturning this, um, what was for more than a century, a non-Aboriginal version, authored version of the Aboriginal past. <clears throat> And it's not in the past today, when you actually look at something that the things that have happened in our modern media environment, for example, I mean, it was only a couple of years ago that National Geographic magazine came out and said, you know, we're actually sorry for constructing these racist uh, stereotypes. You can find um, some of their articles where they're 
writing stories about South American First Nations people and then rewriting the same article about Korean people, or, you know, not to mention some of the other quite damaging and hurtful stereotypes that were constructed through um, what was aimed to be at its start, a journal of exploration and discovery and wonder and bringing the world into people's lounge rooms. But they did a huge mea culpa in some sort of ways and admitted, you know, actually we played a role in that and have been quite proactive in giving First Nations people a voice as editors of particular issues, um, especially as they're exploring all new topics like the Human Genome Project and all these different sorts of things. It's good in some ways to be able to draw a line under that aspect of the past. And um, not to mention when you look at how some of those stereotypes, which um, popular media like, media like National Geographic created, still float around, especially in our online social media world. Um, you know, the way blackface still comes up every now and then, um, some of the online hate that's directed at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when they put their voices out there in the community. Um, those um, dangerous stereotypes of the past still resonate quite heavily today. And it's an important um, factor to take into account in terms of how we um, represent as a museum, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture to audiences. I mean, some of our audiences are international students and people who don't have English as a first language. I mean, how do they visually read these exhibitions? It's really important that the way that they're designed is um, that we take into account um, the ways that people might have entered that sort of information in the past and how do we circumvent it? And so, um, So we circumvented it by giving over the decision-making process. Um, our collections at the museum represent um, the focus of anthropology in particular. Um, the collections that I worked with um, fall into two broad categories. There's the pre-1891 collections of the Maclay Bequest, um, largely amassed by natural history collectors who are working with Aboriginal people as guides while they're collecting natural history specimens to sell to museums around the world. A lot of those um, natural history collectors had side businesses selling ethnographic artifacts and several of our collections came into the museum via those methods before 1891. But after 1920 till around 1960, that's when we have the anthropology department collections, which were transferred across to the museum in the 1970s. And they represent a very different history as well. So being fortunate to sort of start with the story of Sydney, with the very few pieces of tangible evidence we had of Sydney's Aboriginal past. Um, you know, one thing you have to take into account is the Garden Palace fire of the 1880s and just the huge numbers of East Coast Australian artifacts which were destroyed in that fire. There's more tangible heritage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Sydney held in museums in Paris and Britain than there is in Australia. Um, for the modern community members, like the descendants of the of the Eora descendants that we worked with, one of the few objects that we, you know, in a tangible sense that we can work with is the stone tool record. Um, and that sort of grew out of the written and stone exhibition that there was a huge interest in by community members in wanting to engage with those collections to find out more about what they could tell us about the past. And um, so in the Gadigal index case, which sits in the foyer are also two, um, two objects that signal that local story of place. Um, we were able to use the um, Eora languages in things like the landscape design, for example, but these also signal um, some really deep held occupation from Penrith out in Western Sydney with this chopper here and the fish hooks. Um, you know, Sydney being a harbour city, fishing was undertaken by men and women, um, sometimes more women, it seems. Um, and um, they turn up quite regularly. Like there is literally tons of evidence of Sydney's Aboriginal past held in storage museums, in um, stone tools collections of museums. And to reinterpret that, I mean, one of the simple ways that I worked with was that um, if we couldn't name it in the language of its, of its presumed maker, um, it probably didn't go on display. Um, so um, using the word mogo or bera um, and putting that interpretive layer across the top was actually one of the curatorial uh, decision-making processes. Um, it's a lot easier when you're working in, um, 
other parts of the country where they have um, really strong and retained their language. Um, it's easier to name things, but um, reasserting that interpretive layer of the names of things as they are known in Sydney was um, one of the real goals. So across all eight cases, you'll actually see not only the name of the case coming from community members, but also all of the objects named in around 25 different languages from across the country. It was lucky that it was the International Year of Indigenous Languages when I was doing a lot of this research as well, because <laughs> there was some great work happening all across the campus. And I need to keep reinforcing that because it wasn't just me, even though I was the curator, every single one of the cases basically had an ambassador, or in some cases, several ambassadors who sort of guided and helped um, with the decision making process of what the final outcome was. I mean, I was, was not invested in what the final display looked like. Um, it was all about representing that ethical consultation process in the way in the display methodology. <clears throat> so down on the ground floor, um, our case about East Coast New South Wales is called Shield People. And this came from another talk that we did at the museum a couple of um, years ago with uh, Mr. Sean Angelese. He's an Aranda man from Central Australia who works a lot in the repatriation project. Um, and he had this beautiful quote about East Coast people in particular being shield people who sort of shielded the onslaught of colonization before you know, 50, 60, 80 years later, it reached parts of the interior and parts of the remote parts of the country. Um, the shields of East Coast Australia and the Southeastern Australia in particular are a really rich um, area of research as well. Um, so there's all sorts of different ways. It's not just the aesthetic patterns and designs and things that you see upon them. It's, um, you know, what are they made of? You know, some are, some are made from softer woods that float because they're she was owned by coastal people. Some are made from harder woods because they're from the interior. Um, there's all, the, with so much of, um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander the past hidden from Aboriginal people themselves during their whole life. Um, this is Mr. Jeffrey Samuels, who has been a huge personal mentor to me. He was also a volunteer at the museum throughout the um, a couple of years before. When you actually see the ambassador case, there's a little uh, map of the country with the language maps and Jeffrey drew all those for us. I worked with him at Bimali Aboriginal Artist Cooperative and he was an incredible mentor. Um, Jeffrey was a member of the Stolen Generation and only in the last five years of his life, he's found out that he has a different language connection than what he had actually believed through most of his life. So to, to, to see, to meet people who are still on that journey, you know, at such a later age of his life, um, still having information sort of hidden from them because of the processes and of the way that the, um, the records of the missions and reserves movements were um, in some cases destroyed. Um, it really brings it close to you um, how important this is because it's not some abstract past where this happened to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's a living memory that happened in their lifetimes. Um, so to be able to signal his work and involvement through participating in the design of aspects of the cases was a huge um, personal um, something that I've personally really valued and I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to do. Um, so that's actually in the old McLeod um, configuration. You will you'll notice the cases straight away if you've been down there where we're showing predominant uh, natural history collections at the moment. Um, and it's an example of how ambassadors sits inside other exhibitions, not competing with them, but actually just speaking back to them, um, you know, telling that other story of the people who made and donated these shields and how they reinserted their knowledges back helping natural history collectors to find specimens of you know birds or reptiles or fish um, there's sort of infinite sort of connections in some ways but um, to be able to just um, do justice to people to living people's memory was also one of a very one of my really key goals that I wanted to work with Okay, sorry. <clears throat> um, so Karanji, this is from Cardwell. And I'll speed up a bit just to go through a bit of a preview so I can leave some time for questions if you like. But um, 
So each ambassador display case also has an embassy associated with it. And prior to March last year, we had some big designs that um, the embassies, which are all art centers, would be designed and helped in the co-management of things like our education program, of our public programs. Um, they gave us the interpretive layers for some of the labels where you see a little bit more information about objects on display. Um, you know, down the track, it'd be great to have um, internships and, you know, deeper relationships because um, through handing over the interpretive layer, it's also about building back into our programming and just collections management and all those sorts of things, that deeper relationship. So it's not just us, you know, taking information again and representing it and getting the sort of glory as a museum for presenting it in this way. Um, so one of the key ways I worked with a lot of art centers was going up to the Darwin Art Fair, for example, and also the ANCAR, the Association of Northern and Kimberley Art Centers and volunteering at their annual general meetings. I mean, we didn't have a huge, huge consultation budget to spend weeks visiting every community where we had collection items from, but we were able to sort of match at least one remote art center with each display case. And I've been keeping in touch with the managers of the different centers. But yeah, this is a beautiful story from Cardwell, which is about halfway between Cairns and Townsville. Really amazing art center. One of their last exhibitions they did was at the Museum of Oceanography Oceon 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 in Monaco, for example. So there's actually global connections that a lot of these art centers are actually already forging. And for us to be able to sort of tie into that a little bit was a key way that we can actually um, involve them in the long-term life of these exhibitions. Not to mention, hopefully tour some of these objects back to their art centers in future. So another one that came out of those consultations through the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair was this one at Thumpapia. Um, these beautiful fire sticks from Wick country. Um, as well as on the other side of that case, you'll find some, an object, uh, a shield, but it's um, got a blue ochre pattern on it which tells a really deep story about the, you know, the women who are working in um, domestic servitude, for example, and um, giving this blue washing powder to a man who's used it to decorate his shield, um, as well as these beautiful boomerangs from the top there. Um, there's Fiona Weira George. She's also the chairperson of this organization called the Fire Sticks Alliance, which is about reinserting traditional land managed practices in you know, using fire back into the landscape, which is actually being adopted, especially after last summer, um, back into the plans of many rural sort of and regional communities. Um, just another way that like contemporary artists are using museum objects. This is Tony Albert, who's a contemporary artist, but does all these photographic works. Um, you know, demonstrating how these, how these objects work. It's, we're not locking them in the past. They're sometimes sparking these revitalization projects in communities where um, younger artists in particular are just hungry for knowledge. It's like, what sort of wood do I use? What sort of knot pattern is that? Um, how do I sort of tie it off at the end? All the knowledges that are embedded in these um, objects, which, you know, the collection at the museum here dates from like the 1860s to the 1920s, predominantly for a lot of these older materials. Um, is incredibly invaluable. I mean, art centers are crucial. They economically empower people, they actually put cash in people's hands. That's why it's one of the best places to do consultation as well, because it's the, the outward facing aspect of the community. You, know, you don't walk into the, um, you know, the other parts of the community and try and do museum engagement. It's more important to find the ways that community want to engage first and then work backwards from there. Um, Tiwi was, you know, it's just an amazingly strong culture. You know, it has its own, it's a language isolate um, off the coast. It's quite connected to our Darwin exhibition and our Port Essington exhibition as well. But when you look at the distances and where people are traveling in between this, you see the interconnectedness of so much. Um, and, you know, when you look in um, Indonesian records from the, um, from the past, and places like Timor Leste, you find words for the Tiwi Islands and the northern coast of Australia. Like Marij is a word that's used for the northern coastline of Australia. It's where you know you find tamarind trees planted. Um, you know the Macassan trepang industries. There's all these deeper pre-colonial histories which are embedded 
one of the reasons the Tiwi Pukamani poles are so intricate is because steel was introduced to them a lot earlier than British colonization. And it was something that they kept secret sacred without sort of trading it further inland with other peoples. So to try and do justice to those types of stories and histories was just a crucial um, element of letting the objects speak for themselves. And when you look at the language names for the Tiwi objects, they sort of just, they're grouped, um, they, yeah, they're sort of related to body parts. And so it's quite an interesting sort of way to see the objects as, as, as people, objects as ancestors. Um, the selection of the objects, which sort of made it through. We also had this amazing opportunity with the Tiwi Islands where there's an elderly ladies group, Tiwi jazz singers, and they were performing at the Seymour Center. <laughs> Um, right when I was starting the consultations for this exhibition and it was like this is too good an opportunity not to pass up so <laughs> instead of being having to go to Tiwi we actually just paid for some accommodation for another couple of nights and worked with them in the storerooms for a couple of days and they pretty well designed the display of the cases you see it there um, gave me the language words I also went back up and double checked the display cases with them you know that's actually the fun part of consultation actually is, listening to someone's ideas, designing it, and then taking it back to them for final approval, because there was always something I got wrong, you know, in being a translator. I mean, I don't speak, you'd have to be amazing to be able to speak many Aboriginal languages, but a lot of community members do. Um, but, you know, in the storerooms, in community, you know, you can see they're using iPhones and old books to try and interpret the meanings of some of the patterns that we had on the designs of our objects. Um, thanks. Even the way you can use social media now to communicate with community members is actually quite amazing. I can see exhibitions and walk around in exhibitions up in Darwin that I'd never have the resources to actually travel there myself. Um, so you can stay up to date and get real time feedback as well, which is something I like to do. But you know, you, you know, once you put it out there in social media and people can comment back, that's more valuable information that we can add to our databases in the future. Um, the Larrakia exhibition, um, you know, talking to these ladies from the Larrakia Council who gave me the exhibition title, which is about the, the homelands petition of the 1970s. Um, you know, and they were telling me to go out to Penny Bay Jail to find the names of artists who had drawn representations of the type of objects that I was working with. Um, it's only really through talking to people that you get these little clues of information that send you off on all these different sorts of trails. Um, and to be able to bring them back um, and work with that interpretive layer of you know, language words, um, these stories that you would never know just through doing book research is just one of the most crucial ways of actually listening to people and not just talking or asking, but actually just listening and trying to piece together the clues that they're giving back to you. Um, there was a longer, this is like an older consultation with Larrakia community members. So in some cases there was three or four consultations over five or six years with different community members whose knowledges were built back into the way that the exhibition cases were designed and selected. So our old, old storerooms in the library there up on the top floors. Um, <clears throat> the Iwaja exhibition display, which is up on the fourth floor as well. Um, you know, what do you do with these? There's some of the old, oldest bark paintings held by any museum in the world. You know, there's nine of them. We have to rotate them quite regularly just for conservation records. Um, when you go through the original drawings of, um, from the 1870s, when they were presented to the Linnaean Society, you see all this other detail on them that you can't see in the, in the um, way that it's been preserved today. Um, so to be able to share some of that information back with community members, I mean, one of the, there's a really famous artist called Paddy Compass Nemet Barra, and his work sits in the Pompidou Centre in Paris in Andre Breton's um, permanent display of his personal collection. Um, I met a descendant um, whose name was Nemet Barra, and he didn't have a lot of this information about Awaja art in the 1870s. I mean, not many people do. So in some cases, there was actually, you know, we were the ones giving information as well as, you know, receiving information as well. To be able to tell that backstory of this time period. Um, and there's just so much more deeper work that needs to be done as we unfold the, the more and more interpretive layers that come from all this work. 
Um, in the FOIA case, you'll see this amazing um, Iboro, um, like a didgeridoo, um, you know, and tracing it back to the very first um, drawing of its use. This is from the 1820s, um, one of the narratives of a journal around the world. Um, it was in that book that I found the language word that the community member knew because it means neck. Um, and so to sort of cross-reference it in that way to be able to insert, you know, a new name, because didgeridoo isn't the appropriate name, it's from a different part of the country, that language word. So sometimes you're also um, detaching misinformation of the Aboriginal past, um, the way that, um, you know, boomerang, does, you know, the 17 types of boomerang, that's only a name for one type. Um, you really, it gets endless actually trying to find the right language word for the right object from the right place in the right time period. Because sometimes these words change over time as well. So you can see how it becomes a bit of an endless game, but also well worth it in the long run. In the long run. Um, these ones from Western Australia, Derby. Um, I was, I was fortunate to be at the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair because it was a place I couldn't travel to. Um, but the, when I showed these objects, the community member showed me this amazing story that's depicted in a film called Putapuri and the Rainmakers, where they're actually using these beautiful um, Kuleman bowls um, in a ceremonial context. So the design choice to put one of them upside down was to reflect the way that they're used as clouds in this really important dance. You know, they tip water down the backs of the initiates and different things like that. But so to be able to you know, use a conversation about a movie and build that into a design choice was one of the ways that we've tried to really represent all the different types of um, conversations that we had over the time. This is our West Australian collections that we had to work up with and the stories were so valuable that we ended up breaking it up into two separate exhibition cases. And lastly, in the art gallery, so it's an ex the, it's a university art collection exhibition called Coast, um, you know, as opposed to landscape painting, you know, it's about the, the coast as a site, as a zone. Um, and what I was incredibly lucky was the man on the far right there, Daryl Sibisato, is a man I used to work with at Bimali Aboriginal um, Art Gallery in Leichhardt. Um, and he is a Bardi man who today makes these beautiful pearl shell with his brother, Gary Sibisato. Um, so that was another one where I couldn't travel there, but just through having established that relationship in the past, being able to build their story back into it. Um, even when you see the display label in the case, it's actually a quote I took from an Instagram post that we used as the descriptive layer for the type of exhibition. But, you know, thanks to computers and going backwards and forwards, there's so many more ways that we can actually, you can't say that you, I wasn't able to speak to the people. That's just not a valid excuse anymore. There's multiple pathways to have these conversations and I hope you can see them in the exhibition. That's it.